If you get sick and if you get septic, your chance of dying is significant and can be as high as one in three. Nationally, it's a really big deal. We have at least 30,000 patients admitted with sepsis. If you look at the number of people that are affected by sepsis, it's twice as many as those patients that are affected by stroke and heart attack. So this just isn't a, a common cold or a flu. This is when you're, you've got an infection in your bloodstream. You get admitted to hospital for IV fluids and antibiotics, so you're sick. And it's been a challenge to initiate or to integrate sepsis protocols, not because it's not important, but because there's a general lack of awareness. Anybody who takes care of enough patients will experience sepsis firsthand, and when not treated well and aggressively, the outcomes are truly tragic. On a global perspective, this is still the number one cause of death in children worldwide. And in the beginning, we didn't see very many uh, protocols. Um, they were there, but every physician kind of had their way of doing things. You know, when a patient with a stroke comes into hospital, everybody drops what they're doing and they attend to the stroke patient. Somebody comes in with a heart attack, we find out about it before they even come to hospital. That doesn't exist for the poor septic patient. Nobody says, hey, I think we have a septic patient out there. And especially if you have some other illnesses, if you have diabetes, if maybe you have cancer, if you're frail, elderly, your chance of, of dying is significant. When I was a trainee in emergency medicine, uh, we had a child come into emergency who was critically ill. And we didn't have the guidelines and the protocols in place at the time. And despite hours of attempted care in emergency, um, the patients uh, did not survive his emergency department visit. I'd really like to see a healthcare system full of clinicians who have sepsis kind of as an index of suspicion, that recognize the time sensitivity associated with the disease, that recognize sort of the common signs and symptoms, and feel empowered to, to speak up. We're a lot more aggressive with sepsis than we used to be. And now we have uh, BC sepsis guidelines that are very well known throughout the province. Child Health BC has published pediatric sepsis guidelines and having those guidelines and screening tools readily available at triage would be an easy first step to help remind people how to look for the signs of sepsis in children. Without the guidelines, I think that a lot more people would become critically ill or not make it. We want to see every emergency department that sees over 10,000 patients a year to have a sepsis protocol in place. We want to see them identifying patients early and treating them according to the BC sepsis guidelines. We all have a variety of experiences in our healthcare careers and as a person works in healthcare for a while you, you really do obtain the ability to be able to look at someone right away and go, oh geez, they're sick. We know how important it is to identify these people. We know how high their mortality will be if not treated well and we know that the therapies that are going to improve their outcomes are simple treatments. The key ways to identify one of these patients is, first off, to look at their vital signs. A temperature that's either below 36 or above 38, or a heart rate over 90, respiratory rate over 20, or a change in the person's mental status from their normal. And it presents a little bit differently in children than it does in adults. Uh, the signs can be a bit more subtle um, and they are very age dependent. If we see that in a patient and the nurse at triage suspects that they might have an infection, these are the patients that need to be screened to see if they have uh, characteristics that are compatible with severe sepsis or septic shock. We know that we need to have that lactate drawn within 30 minutes. So we make it a priority to get to that patient right away because the faster we draw the blood, the faster the physician can make their diagnosis and potentially speed the process for the patient. If it's elevated, we'll need to aggressively get antibiotics into them and to start resuscitating them with fluids. Additionally, if they have a low blood pressure, these are also the patients we need to identify. We have to have a shift in the way we think about these people. We need to identify them early, we need to resuscitate them early, and we need to get their antibiotics in early. And, and if we can get all that together uh, within an hour, uh, we can save lives. It's kind of motherhood and apple pie type stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's not a lot of money, it's not a lot of technology. So I've certainly seen people come in and look near death, almost unresponsive. The patient looks septic to the staff, it was identified, the lab work was done, and the intervention started so that the patient received their antibiotics, their fluids. And after a few hours of resuscitation, they've turned right around, they're sitting up, 
in the bed, eyes open, can hold a conversation. The guidelines are out there now, they're published, they're evidence-based, and they're, uh, they're irrefutable. So it's, this is not uh, experimental anymore. So if you get quite sick with sepsis, we only have to treat five people to save one life. So it's that intrinsic motivating that I want people to think about. Why? Why do we do this? Why do we care about these people? And I think the reason why is because these are the people that, that we care about. These are the people in our community. Because the reality is, is that it will affect one of us or someone in our families. Early intervention and treatment in very simple ways um, can save lives. Being part of the Sepsis Network, I think, would certainly make a difference in, in just awareness and access to resources. The BC Sepsis Network is there to support them, and we want to see the best care no matter where.